In our modern era, reflections often lead us to wonder if our world mirrors the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some may argue that today's societal issues don't compare, but let's take a moment to examine the parallels. Imagine, if you will, current headlines that shock and dismay. Instances of incest, siblings entangled in forbidden love, religious leaders embracing unions they once condemned, and alarming discussions advocating for the normalization of pedophilia. These narratives, ripped from today's news feeds, echo troubling behaviors that seem rampant in our society. Even high-ranking religious figures navigate the turbulent waters of moral debate, sometimes prioritizing contemporary societal issues over the foundational teachings of our faith. The internet becomes a stage for taboo acts, while societal debates often prioritize gender and identity over spiritual guidance and unity. This reflection takes us back to a pivotal story from the book of Genesis, focusing on Sodom and Gomorrah, cities that thrived on the surface, yet were corroded by sin beneath. Their tale serves as a reminder of the consequences of moral decay. The narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah's downfall begins with a divine revelation. The sin within these cities had escalated to such an extent that it summoned a response from the heavens. The Lord's observation, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous, Genesis 18.20, underscores a vital lesson. While the divine is omniscient, there's an expectation for humanity to manifest its virtues through actions and decisions. The dialogue between God and Abraham regarding justice highlights a journey of understanding and the application of righteousness, rather than a mere divine decree. This story emphasizes the significance of our deeds and their impact, both seen and unseen. Before the joyous arrival of Isaac, the cherished offspring of Abraham, a narrative unfolds, painting a stark contrast between the benevolent character of Abraham and the notorious cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, a paragon of faith and generosity, stands out amidst a backdrop marked by selfishness and depravity. In the midst of moral decay, his life beams as a beacon of hope and compassion. It's a tale of two worlds, where Abraham's prayers for mercy intertwine with the looming judgment over cities lost to vice. This part of history is a stark showcase of the consequences of unchecked immorality and the power of intercession. Abraham's dialogue with God wasn't just a plea. It was a challenge to divine judgment asking if the righteous would be swept away with the wicked. This moment underscores a critical moral principle, the importance of individual accountability over collective condemnation. At the heart of this saga lies a pivotal exchange, a divine covenant with Abraham, a man whose faith had the power to alter destinies. It was during these defining moments that God disclosed his grievous decision to obliterate Sodom and Gomorrah cities now synonymous with sin and judgment. Yet it was Abraham's relentless intercession that highlighted his profound concern for the innocents among the guilty. His plea to God, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Genesis 18.23 echoes the timeless dilemma of collective punishment versus individual accountability. A theme resonant in ancient lore, from the Hittite prayers to the epics of Gilgamesh, where leaders beseech the gods for discernment in their wrath sparing the blameless amidst the condemned. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah serves as a dual lesson. Firstly, it's a warning about the downfall that comes from living in excess and ignoring ethical boundaries. Secondly, and more importantly, it highlights the significance of standing up for what's right, even among seemingly insurmountable odds. Abraham's attempt to negotiate God's mercy showcases the potential impact of righteous advocacy. Sodom and Gomorrah, despite their affluence, were blind to their impending doom, engulfed in a culture of excess and moral bankruptcy. Sound familiar? Let us then draw inspiration from Abraham's legacy. In a world teetering on the brink of moral ambiguity, his story reminds us of the power of standing firm in one's convictions, advocating for the innocent, and the transformative potential of compassion and mercy. It's a call to action a reminder that each of us holds the capacity to make a difference. 
to sway the scales of justice and mercy in a world desperately in need of both. We delve deeper into the narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah, shifting our focus to the inhabitants themselves. Their lives, a tapestry of individual choices and actions, collectively weave the fate of their cities. This tale transcends time, reflecting our contemporary society and personal decisions, serving as a poignant reminder that the consequences of our actions are far-reaching and irreversible. It's a cautionary reflection, emphasizing the vital importance of adhering to moral principles and shaping our lives and the society at large. The wrongdoing of Sodom and Gomorrah, subjects of extensive scholarly debate, symbolizes more than just the overt acts of depravity witnessed by the angels in Lot's encounter. It's crucial to understand that the sins of these cities were multifaceted, embodying not only sexual transgressions, but also a profound disregard for human dignity and compassion. This narrative, as chronicled in Genesis 19 and further expounded in texts like 2 Peter and Jude, illustrates a pattern of behavior that's both destructive and disdainful, impacting righteous individuals such as Lot. This broader interpretation of sin highlights a critical lesson. Moral decay is not solely about individual acts of wrongdoing, but encompasses a community's failure to uphold values of respect, care, and hospitality. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah serves as a mirror, reflecting the consequences of societal negligence towards these fundamental human virtues. As we reflect on this narrative, it's essential to grasp the underlying message it conveys about the consequences of moral compromise. The downfall of Sodom and Gomorrah is not just a tale of divine retribution, but a testament to the inherent dangers of forsaking ethical values. It's a call to introspection and action, urging us to live lives grounded in virtue and to foster communities that cherish and uphold the dignity of every individual. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah unfurls as a cautionary tale a reflection of humanity's gravest failings. At the heart of their downfall was not merely a single sin, but a confluence of transgressions that painted a broader picture of societal decay. The narrative pivots around the disregard for sacred virtues, compassion, humility, and respect for the stranger among us. This tale, deeply embedded within Genesis 19, illuminates the dire consequences of such moral bankruptcy the account begins as twilight descends upon the ancient cities, now synonymous with ultimate depravity. Here, Lot, a man of virtue amidst vice, becomes the unexpected host to celestial visitors, disguised as mere mortals. In an era where the guest was sacred, the townsfolk's hostile reception of these divine messengers was a glaring testament to their fallen state. The aggression and inhospitality they displayed were symptoms of a deeper malaise a pervasive moral rot that had taken hold. Yet the transgressions of Sodom and Gomorrah extended beyond their immediate hostility. Genesis 19 is a vivid scene where Lot, a man living in Sodom, encounters two angels disguised as men. In an era where hospitality was sacred, the men of Sodom's aggressive refusal to extend kindness to these strangers marked a significant departure from righteousness. Before they'd all gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so we can have sex with them. Genesis 19, 4-5 This chilling moment underscores not just a breach of hospitality, but an intent to commit grave harm. Expanding upon the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, Ezekiel 16, 49-50 casts a wider net revealing that their inequity was multifaceted. Now this was the sin of your sister, Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. Here, the prophet Ezekiel speaks to a broader societal malaise, a community steeped in pride, gluttony, and apathy towards the suffering of others. The New Testament reflections further this discussion with Jude 1.7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. 
They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Making a pointed reference to Sodom and Gomorrah's lewd behavior as an example of divine retribution for those who engage in sexual immorality and pursue unnatural desire. Similarly, 2 Peter 2, 6-10 admonishes the sensuous and rebellious ways of those cities, highlighting Lot's torment at their lawless deeds. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. This multifaceted exploration of sin, spanning from inhospitality to sexual immorality and a lack of compassion for the needy, serves as a potent reminder of the consequences of straying from divine laws. The judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah is not merely an account of punishment, but a call to self-reflection, urging us to consider our own actions and their impact on the world around us. This multifaceted sinfulness, characterized by an insatiable lust for forbidden desires and a flagrant disrespect for sacred laws, set the stage for their ultimate doom. The scriptures recount not merely a tale of divine wrath, but a lesson imbued with timeless relevance. The judgment upon these cities serves as a stark reminder that such profound moral failures invites inevitable consequence. Across the breadth of biblical literature from the prophetic to the apostolic, the saga of Sodom and Gomorrah is invoked with a sense of ultimate degradation and divine justice. Their story is a confluence of humanity's darkest impulses, unchecked sensuality, disregard for the divine, and a wholesale abandonment of virtue. Was the city destroyed because the men of Sodom attempted to rape the angels? The answer is obvious, no. God's judgment could not have been for the greedy effort itself because he decided to destroy the towns days before the meeting. See Genesis 18.20. Furthermore, Peter emphasizes that the evil action was continual, day after day, and not a one-time occurrence. The uproar had already been going up to God for a while. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah emerges as a narrative rich in moral lessons, a beacon warning against the peril of moral collapse. Their legacy, a grim testament to the fate that befalls those who stray from the path of righteousness, serves as a powerful call to introspection and reform. As we reflect upon this age-old tale, one cannot help but ponder. In today's world, how do we measure up against the yardstick of Sodom and Gomorrah's failings? Are we heedful of the stranger, the needy, the voiceless among us? I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments below. And if this message resonates with you, please consider liking and subscribing for more insights into our shared spiritual journey. Let us close with a brief prayer. May we always find the strength to extend our hands in kindness, to uphold justice, and to walk humbly with our Creator. Amen. Do you realize that your mind and soul have a tremendous impact on shaping who you are and how you navigate life in this world? But still, even though the mind and soul are powerful, what they feed on holds even greater power. The things you see, the stories you hear, the music you enjoy, and the movies you watch wield significant influence. They not only mold your mind, but also shape your culture or lifestyle in ways beyond what you might notice. Throughout human history, various aspects of civilization have emerged. But movies, TV series, and the entire entertainment landscape stand out as influential contributors to our cultural development and civilization. Not only do they possess a unique ability to entertain, inspire, and motivate individuals towards positive actions in society, they also have the potential to lead people astray from values and morals we cherish as Christians. So what do you do when you encounter such destructive information? Today, let us delve into some fascinating insights about the media landscape and discover how to remain vigilant as a Christian and not compromise your faith. I'm confident that as you watch this video with an open heart, you'll find blessings in this divine message. To begin, let's explore if there are certain types of movies that the Bible condemns. Are there TV shows that the Bible explicitly advises us to avoid? And additionally, what kind of music aligns with Christian values and is safe to listen to? And most importantly, how do our choices in entertainment impact our faith in Christ Jesus? 
If you say that the Bible doesn't explicitly outline what kind of entertainment is ideal for believers, you'll be right. However, the Bible's language allows us to discern what it endorses and what it discourages. Here's what I mean. While there's no direct mention of avoiding funny shows, the scripture does caution against engaging in evil communication, emphasizing the impact words can have on our character. Similarly, the Bible reminds us that we'll be held accountable for every idle word spoken. In the vast world of media today, various genres coexist. Notably, horror movies have gained immense popularity, attracting a diverse audience, Christians included. The influence these movies exert, reaching billions of people, prompts us to reflect on their potential impact and our engagement with them. Now friends, are horror movies the only ones that don't quite align with Christian teachings? Well, let me tell you, that's a big fat no. There are other types of movies out there that don't quite resonate with the core values of our Christian faith. In their quest to entertain and create content, some folks go all out, crafting stories that are totally against what we believe in. These movies make sin look tempting, throw fear around like confetti, and dilute our faith. For example, horror movies feed this uncontrollable desire for spookiness messing with the minds of young adults and other viewers. They paint a picture that fear is just a regular part of life. Now this goes against what the Bible teaches us. God's Word says that fear is not of God. So, indulging in this kind of entertainment comes at a cost. It makes us numb to things like witchcraft, evil, suffering, torture, and pain. This is a not-so-great price we pay for being entertained by these stories, isn't it? Let us consider witchcraft. The Bible's pretty clear about this one. That's a big no-no. From cover to cover, you won't find a single verse cheering on the practice of witchcraft among believers. Whether it's fortune-telling, talking to the dead, messing with voodoo-casting spells, or anything like that, the Bible's stance has always been a firm, not allowed, when it comes to these things. Deuteronomy 18, 10-12 says, let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. Witchcraft was one of the terrible sins that corrupted the people of Canaan, causing all sorts of trouble and making God decide to kick them out. God didn't want his people getting tangled up in witchcraft. Witchcraft is all about dealing with evil spirits, whether you know it or not. And for us Christians, that's a big no-no. Now, some folks, even Christians, get it wrong. They think witchcraft is always this conscious, deliberate thing. Some even believe there's a good side to it. But, my friends, that's not true. Lots of people today unknowingly get caught up in witchcraft. And that doesn't change the fact that what they're doing is, well, witchcraft. Dear Saint, anytime you go to sorcerers, mediums, or fortune tellers, you're opening yourself up to the influence of demons and Satan. These people don't know God or the future, and their predictions aren't reliable. Even if they sometimes get things right, it doesn't help anyone. Instead, God uses the Bible to tell us who we should be and what the future holds. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul strongly warns the church about witchcraft and its activities. He lists witchcraft as one of the sinful works that we should avoid. This shows us that the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with these practices. The works of the flesh come from our sinful nature, while the fruit of the Spirit comes from our renewed selves. Our sinful nature always wants things to go against the Spirit. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. God's Spirit and our sinful nature known as the flesh are completely different. They have different desires, thoughts, and goals. They will keep on fighting each other as long as we're alive. The flesh is what we inherit from our parents, and it'll never give up or stop wanting the wrong things. 
In fact, it always gets worse over time. On the other hand, God's Spirit will oppose the flesh at every turn and won't give in to any of its demands. Think about this. If you were the devil, wouldn't you suggest things that are really tempting to people's desires? Of course. That's exactly how he uses the media to trap people without them even realizing it. The devil has a plan, and to carry it out, he needs lots of people on his side. And that's why he keeps subtly recruiting people to join him in his main goal, which is rebelling against God. And what tool is he using? Pfft, media. Did you know that on average, an American spends about three to four hours every day watching live TV and streaming content online? That's incredible. It adds up to about 21 to 28 hours a week spent consuming media. This shows what people are filling their minds with day in and day out. Just imagine if those hours were spent studying the Bible and praying to learn more about God. That would be amazing, right? It's true that demons are always looking for people they can influence because they're spirits without bodies. However, demons don't possess people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. They possess people who are not filled with His Spirit. Nature doesn't permit empty spaces, so demons look for opportunities to fill them. Matthew 12, 43-45 explains that. When an impure spirit comes out of a person that goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it, then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be in this wicked generation. Jesus teaches us in this scripture that being spiritually empty makes it easier for demons to take over. When a person is empty inside, demons can move in and take control. We can see how these evil spirits operate. Even after they've been cast out, they try to come back to the person they left. Demons have different levels of power, some stronger than others. They can have a really bad impact on a person's life, making it meaningless and unproductive. Think about the man at the tomb. Before he met Jesus, he was out of control, tied up with chains and living in a cemetery. Who lives in a cemetery if not someone possessed by demons? Just imagine the suffering and fear of living in such a dark and scary place. It's like the horror movies we see today. They subtly try to make the torture, pain, and fear seem appealing. But these are all the tricks of the demon spirits. The story of the man possessed by demons in Mark 5 shows us how serious demonic possession can be and why we need to stay away from anything that might lead to it. There have been reports of people who said that while watching popular horror movies, something entered them and their lives changed. This isn't something to ignore. Many people have fainted or even thrown up while watching these movies. Even more troubling is that some have been possessed while watching and then tormented in their dreams. I heard about someone who watched a terrifying movie about a demon in the form of a snake killing and tormenting people. That night, they dreamed about the same snake tormenting them, and it almost drove them crazy in real life. You might think it's just a psychological issue, but this is more than just psychology. It's demonic. How can an experience from a movie become your real-life experience and affect your social life? Yet this is the reality for many people who are deeply hooked on horror movies. While not everyone falls into this real-life torture, it's equally disheartening that those who aren't subjected to this kind of suffering now see many forms of torture as normal. They think there's no need to sympathize with people going through trauma. You see people laughing and mocking at those who are suffering because they've been exposed to more severe and life-threatening trauma in movies. And now they lack the empathy for real-life suffering. They even make comedy skits out of it. This too is a form of demonic manipulation. Billions of dollars are spent each year in the entertainment industry to shape individuals' minds and perspectives. The truth is that this massive amount of money comes from the worldly system to enslave people's minds. Beloved, Satan's goal is straightforward. Flood the media with more and more content, enslave people, normalize sin, weaken their faith, fill their hearts with fear, 
and manipulate him long enough until he ultimately takes them over. Look at what sin has done to many Christians today, and you'll see this pattern repeating time and time again. Entertainment has made sin and fear of God seem insignificant. Sin is no longer seen as a reason for repentance. Instead, it's viewed as a source of entertainment. This is the devil's plan. The influence of the media is rapidly changing societal values and norms. The media is a powerful tool, and the devil knows this well. He's fully invested in maximizing this opportunity, even more than believers. Since we may not be able to completely disconnect from the world of media and entertainment, we must let God's Word guide our hearts and minds. Our moral boundaries should come from God's Word, not societal acceptance. We must stand on what the Word says, not what the world says, just as the Apostle Paul advised in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. My friends, our minds and thoughts are incredibly important in life. They largely determine our actions. Believers should have renewed minds and focus on heavenly things. We should keep our thoughts on the things of God. Sinful, worldly, and evil things are tempting to our sinful nature. If we let our thoughts dwell on such things, we may be overcome by desire for them. If our thoughts are always on true, pure, and excellent things, we'll be better able to reject and control sinful desires. So, we should be very careful about what we read, watch, and listen to, and where we allow our imaginations to take us. If we fill our minds with the things unworthy for believers in Christ, we may soon live lives unworthy of Christ. So the next time you come across a horror movie, a movie promoting witchcraft, or any form of ungodliness on your TV, switch off your device. When God created Adam and Eve, He provided everything needed for life and dominion on earth. However, they were deceived by Satan and fell from the exalted position God had given them due to their misuse of free will. When God confronted Adam about his sin, he immediately began what we now call the blame game in Genesis 3. The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. The simple, often overlooked statement marks the start of the consequences of free will. Though we are created with the freedom to make choices, we will be held accountable for our decisions. Because of Adam's fall and the effect it had on all of us, we're all in desperate need of a savior. But here's the good news. God in his mercy has made a way for us to be restored through Jesus Christ. However, this gift of salvation isn't automatically given to everyone. Have you ever thought about how even though salvation is free for everyone, some people might miss out on God's offer of salvation? It's a pretty mind-boggling concept, right? Well, in today's video, we're going to dive into six groups of people that God can't save. I'm really excited about this discussion because by the end of the video, I believe that you will be blessed and your perspective will be transformed. So, buckle up. Before we jump into this, I want to clarify something important. When we talk about God cannot save in this context, it's not about a limit to God's power. God is all-powerful and can do anything. What we're discussing here is the state of the person themselves. It's like saying that if someone continues on a certain path, they're essentially making it impossible for God to save them. So, just to be clear, this has nothing to do with God's ability to save. He can save anyone, anytime. Based on what we know about God from Scripture, we can identify certain types of people that God, as a matter of principle, cannot save. So, let's get into it. The six kinds of people that fall into this category. Number one, the reprobate. The reprobates are people who were allowed to be overtaken by depraved minds because of their inability to embrace God's mercy. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 22 gives us more details about them. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. 
The knowledge of God is the ultimate treasure. It's more valuable than anything else in this world, more precious than gold, riches, or wealth. But a lot of folks out there don't realize how precious this knowledge really is. Some even treat it like it's only meant for certain types of people, maybe the less fortunate or those who are seen as super religious. But the hard truth is that those who disregard this treasure will face consequences. God's penalty for them is to essentially let them be consumed by the very things they've chosen over Him. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? These reprobates are choosing to believe a lie rather than God's truth. They're putting their focus on created things instead of the Creator, completely denying God's power even when it's all around them. It's like the Psalms say, only a fool say there's no God. We're seeing a concerning rise in false religion these days, spreading ideas that deny the existence of God and promote all kinds of ungodly stuff. In some places, it's not even about denying God's existence. They're claiming that you're your own God or that there's a God within you. It's leading people down a path where they become reprobates. And once you're in that place, God can't save you because you've shut him out of your heart and mind. It's heavy stuff and many shy away from it, but it's important to talk about so that we aren't lured into it. Let's keep going. Number two, the self-righteous. Matthew chapter five, verse 20 reads, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Saints, Jesus really lays it out plainly and simply in this verse. He's letting us know that not everyone who claims to be religious is automatically in God's kingdom. It's a different kind of righteousness that's needed instead of the self-righteousness that comes from trying to follow the rules or do good deeds. Consider the false righteousness we see in the Pharisees, those religious leaders of Jesus' time. Even the least of believers in Christ has a righteousness that surpasses theirs. So, what does God actually require for us to be part of His kingdom? It's a righteousness that comes from having faith in Christ. It's this faith that connects us with Christ and brings His Spirit into our lives. It's not just about being seen as righteous in God's eyes. It also changes us from the inside out, making righteous living possible for us. It's a powerful idea, don't you think? The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 paints a clear picture of the kind of righteousness that God approves and the kind that He rejects. When our behaviors come from a heart that's been changed by God, it's on a different level than the righteousness that's just surface level, produced by our human nature. What kind of righteousness could we ever produce on our own? Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 puts it in stark terms, saying that all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. It's a powerful reminder of just how much we need God's grace and transformation in our lives. Jesus shares this parable that speaks to those who are pretty sure they had everything together, morally and spiritually speaking, in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Beloved, God cannot save the self-righteous because they trust more in their good works than in Jesus' sacrifice for us. Good works cannot save anyone. Only faith in His sacrifice saves. Now to the third category. Number three, the unbelievers. Let's talk about the unbelievers for a while. Jesus spoke about unbelief several times while he was on earth. In John chapter 3, verse 18, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Those who truly believe in Jesus are completely forgiven. Their sins are wiped away by Christ's sacrificial death, and they are seen as innocent and righteous. This means there's no condemnation for them, but it's a different story for unbelievers. It's clear that faith is a huge deal in the teachings of the Bible, and we're reminded in 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, 
Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. By refusing to believe, unbelievers turn their backs on God's one and only solution for their sins. In fact, by rejecting God's greatest gift and refusing to believe, they're essentially calling God a liar. If they don't change their ways and embrace the gospel, there's only one outcome for them, condemnation. Number four, blasphemers or apostates. Mark chapter three, verses 28 through 29 says, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. God is the one who empowers people to repent, and it's the Holy Spirit working in our hearts that guides us towards repentance. But when we resist and refuse to turn from our ways and even speak against God, He won't force us to change. As a result, those who harden their hearts will never repent and consequently won't be forgiven. It's important to be mindful of our words and reaction to God's work. Sometimes it's better to stay silent when we don't fully understand something rather than speaking without enough knowledge. Just think about how many people dismiss the incredible things God does today, claiming they're fake. When people consistently reject the Holy Spirit's power, it becomes difficult for God to save them from their sins, as the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts people of their wrongdoing. How can He do this when they continually downplay His abilities? It's crucial to remember that the Holy Spirit is fully God and has emotions. He can be deeply hurt by blasphemous statements and disbelief in His power and work. This is a significant reason why many struggle to find salvation. They've been consumed by blasphemy. Number five, the hypocrites. As described in Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 15, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Friends, hypocrites are nothing but imposters. They parade around, claiming virtues they do not possess. What's their goal? To exploit the vulnerable and downtrodden, only to veil their transgressions beneath a facade of religious piety. Moreover, they also strive to discourage others from embracing faith in God. Their religious devotion consists of mere activities, void of genuine devotion. Instead of guiding souls towards God, they seek to make themselves look good and amass followers to their own sect. Such lifestyles, motivated solely by self-aggrandizement, stand as hollow and misguided pursuits, devoid of any alignment with true Christian principles. Reflecting on the Pharisees of old, we witness an illustration of misapplied zealous fervor resulting in disastrous outcomes. Their fervent religious activities yielded followers who were more morally bankrupt than themselves. Hence, Jesus, in no uncertain terms, denounced both these leaders and their converts as progenies of damnation. Regrettably, dear friends, this wicked sin persists today, and it will cause those guilty of it to sink deep into God's condemnation for all eternity if they do not repent. Now. Let us turn our attention to the final kind of people whom God cannot save. Number six, those who seek salvation through other means. Friends, even with the widespread reach of the gospel today, thanks to evangelists, missionaries, and social media, there are still people who firmly believe that salvation isn't solely found in Jesus. They acknowledge that humanity needs to be reconciled with God and recognize their helplessness and sin. However, they don't accept that the only path to God is through Jesus Christ alone. This is directly addressed by Jesus himself in John chapter 14, verse 6, where he clearly states that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through him. My friends, it's important to understand that Jesus isn't just one option among many. He is the only way. While many may struggle with this teaching, our personal preferences won't change this fundamental truth. Instead of resisting it, 
We should choose to embrace it because Jesus is the embodiment of truth and does not lie. He himself declared that he is the only Son of God, the key to spiritual life, the one we must believe in to avoid being lost forever. He is the sole door for God's people and the only shepherd. Let's put our trust in him, not only because of who he is, but also because of the compelling evidence he has provided. Finally, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The apostles shared this teaching because it was passed down to them by Jesus himself. Salvation is a profound concept in the New Testament, encompassing the forgiveness of sins, spiritual rebirth, freedom from the shackles of sin, being deemed righteous by God, and the promise of eternal life in His presence. My dear friend, you can embrace this salvation today. The Bible urges us that, if we hear His voice, we should not harden our hearts. Let's not deliberately choose a path that obstructs God's provision of salvation. Instead, Listen as Jesus knocks at the door of your heart today. You can welcome him in and secure your eternal salvation. It's becoming a popular trend in the music and entertainment industry to praise and even idolize anything that stands against what the Christian faith stands for. And it is very surprising and pretty disheartening that a lot of Christians haven't picked up on this. Some even brush it off like it's not a big deal. Take, for instance, how the famous American pop star known as Lady Gaga has often publicly displayed that she is anything but a lady, a lady who is of the devil, standing for nothing godly or which belongs to the light. In her song Judas, Lady Gaga offensively references Jesus Christ, praising Judas for betraying Christ. She sang about washing Jesus' feet insincerely with her hair to bring him down, expressing love for Judas and referring to him as the demon she clings to. In her song Judas, Lady Gaga refers to herself as a holy fool, but her actions are seen as unholy, much like the betrayal of the Savior by Judas. She also sings, in the most biblical sense, I am beyond repentance, and expresses being in love with Judas. During a live performance of this song, something shocking occurred when Lady Gaga was hit by a stage prop just before the performance do you think this was a coincidence? You see, our God is the God of knowledge, and nothing bypasses Him. It's true that God is loving, but He's also just. Sometimes, His judgment is immediate, and other times, He may seem silent. We can't question Him because He is in control and knows what's best for those who go against His will. As you think about this, Consider why anyone would dare to mock God, as we see Lady Gaga and other celebrities do too often. Look, the choice of who we follow is a powerful example of the freedom God gives us as humans. It's really up to us to decide what feels right or wrong. That's why God doesn't usually step in when it comes to these personal decisions. The choice is yours to make. Yet, it's hard to believe that some people even though they turn away from God and Jesus' sacrifice, take it a step further by disrespecting God. They do this through their words, behavior, and choices. It's truly beyond understanding. Now, let me share with you a very shocking portion of Scripture from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. It reads, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. You see, my friends, when we say God cannot be mocked, it's not just a saying, it's a profound truth that echoes throughout the Bible. This truth isn't just in words, it's shown in the stories of many biblical figures. Let's explore a few of these stories and let me show you what happened to those who made the mistake of mocking God. Number one is Sennacherib. Sennacherib, the mighty Assyrian king, dared to mock God in a time when King Hezekiah ruled over Judah. This wasn't just any taunt, it was deeply offensive. The Bible recounts that Sennacherib set his sights on Judah, laying siege to its strongholds with the intent of conquering them. He was relentless his army encircling the cities ready to strike.
But Hezekiah, seeing the threat to Jerusalem, wasn't about to give in. He started devising his own plans, determined to outwit Sennacherib and protect his people. King Hezekiah rolled up his sleeves and got to work. He fixed the broken parts of the city wall and added strong towers for protection. He even built new walls further out. The city of David was made stronger than ever. He didn't stop there. He stocked up on weapons like spears and shields. Then he chose military leaders to look after the people and gathered everyone in the city square to get organized. It was all hands on deck to keep the city safe. Hezekiah stood before his people with a message of hope. Be brave and strong. Don't be afraid of the king of Assyria and his army. We have more on our side than he has on his. He has his soldiers, but we have the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. When Sennacherib heard about Hezekiah's protections, he sent a message to challenge this faith, as recorded in the scripture of 2 Chronicles 32, verses 13 to 17. Do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Now do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him. For no god of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my predecessors. How much less will your god deliver you from my hand? Sennacherib's officers spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. The king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him, Just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Then Hezekiah, joined by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, responded by praying and calling up to the God of heaven. God answered their prayers by sending an angel who wiped out everyone in the Assyrian camp in one night, both warriors and officers. We are talking about well over 150,000 men. On witnessing this, Sennacherib was forced to return home in disgrace, tail between his legs. However, when he went into the temple of his God, his own sons killed him. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and the officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. Number two is King Nebuchadnezzar. Our next character who mocked God and was dealt with for that is Nebuchadnezzar, a mighty king of Babylon. Even after God warned him in a dream, his pride got the best of him. He ended up bragging about his achievements, saying he built Babylon all on his own to show off his power and glory. But here's the catch. He claimed all the credit for himself. That's where he went wrong. The Bible teaches us in Psalm 127 that without God's blessing, all our efforts are pointless. Nebuchadnezzar's boastful claim was in direct challenge to this wisdom, and it didn't go unnoticed. What was the judgment of God used in humbling this great king? It was so humiliating that you would never have guessed it. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what I decree for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by before you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Perhaps, my friend, you might be thinking that such judgments only happened in the Old Testament times, right? Well, let me tell you about someone from the New Testament who also mocked God and received judgment as well. It was King Herod. His actions showed a clear disregard for God. 
And what's even more shocking is that he was egged on by the people around him, which is one funny thing about life. People would often make us feel like their approval and validation is all that matters, but it isn't. You must fear God enough to know when even the most appreciated things by the world's standards are wrong before Him. So, the Bible tells us that King Herod was caught in a big argument with the people from Tyre and Sidon. They really needed to make peace because he was in charge of their food. So they got together and went to see him in Caesarea to sort things out. On the day they met, Herod was all dressed up in his kingly outfit, looking very grand. He sat on his throne and gave a powerful speech that really impressed everyone. When he finished, the crowd cheered loudly, saying he spoke like a god, not just a man. But here's the thing. Herod could have said no to such praise, or at least not agreed with it in his heart. Now, let's take a look at how this story ends. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. My friends, there's never been a time when making fun of God or speaking disrespectfully about Him has turned out well. God's response to such mockery is always strong and serious. Don't be fooled into thinking you can get away with mocking God. You see, God's way of justice is beyond what we can understand. It's not something science can make sense of, nor can the smartest minds fully grasp it. No expert in the world can truly explain how God's justice operates. That's why it's so important to be mindful and respectful so as not to find yourself on the wrong side of God's living presence. Now, let me quickly share with you some dangers of mocking God. The first danger of mocking God is the danger of untimely death or disease. Nothing cuts short the life of a man like mocking the ever-living God. The Bible warns us about this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, that falling into the hands of the living God is a fearful thing because God is holy. He hates sin and will surely punish unbelief, rebellion, and mockery. This is why we must be careful not to fall into the trap of the enemy. Many people today, especially celebrities and famous people, are quick to publicly mock God because of the applause of their fans and followers. But we must be very careful. There are stories of people who mocked God and were instantly inflicted with terminal diseases. A very touching story was told of John Lennon of the Beatles. Almost everyone knows who the Beatles were. In the 60s, the band became such a phenomenon. The ladies were head over heels in love with each one of the band members, especially John Lennon. But John had a problem. He didn't believe in Jesus and was ready to talk God down whenever an opportunity presented itself. Some years down the line, during his interview with an American magazine, he said, Christianity will end. It will disappear. I do not have to argue about that, I am certain. Jesus was okay, but his subjects were too simple. Today, we are more famous than him. This statement was made in 1966. His remark caused an outrage among their fans and triggered a protest rally where people expressed their anger by stepping and setting the vinyl record and the Beatles poster on fire. On 8 December 1980, John Lennon was shot six times by one of his fanatics in front of his house and died at the spot. What a tragic end! The second danger of mocking God is the danger of hell. When people make mockery of God, they are putting themselves at the danger of spending eternity without God. Eternity, my friend, is too long a period to be spent without the love of God. Many people may take this warning for granted, but the truth is, never allow the facade of fame and popularity to push you to the walls of spending eternity in hell. Jesus warns us sternly about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. As we go about our day-to-day -day activities in this modern world, where people seize every opportunity to mock God, 
I want to bring to your mind again that even though God is love, He is also a just God and will judge the sins of humanity. God is all-loving, but He is also the consuming fire. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. New King James Version tells us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This verse is a stark reminder that our lives are part of a grander, unseen battle. It's not just about what we see and touch, but about what we don't see, the spiritual realm where forces beyond our understanding are at play. Friends, let's talk about something real, something raw, and deeply relevant to our spiritual lives. Have you ever had a dream that lingered, haunting your waking moments? Dreams can be windows, revealing the unseen battles we're part of. They can signal when something's amiss in the spiritual realm, particularly pointing towards witchcraft activities, subtly influencing our lives. Let's dive into this with an open heart and a vigilant spirit. Number one, eating in your dreams or dog bites. Ever woke up feeling uneasy after dreaming of feasting on unknown delicacies or startled by a dream where a dog, man's supposed best friend, turns on you with a bite? These aren't just random dream fragments. They're spiritual indicators. Eating in dreams isn't just a nocturnal activity. It's a spiritual transaction. These meals, seemingly innocent, are spiritual concoctions brewed in the cauldrons of darkness, intended to weave unseen covenants with malevolent forces. It's like unknowingly signing a contract in your sleep, binding you to the whims of darkness. What about dog bites? In dreams, dogs are not always the loyal companions we know. Instead, they can be disguises for malevolent spirits, launching covert attacks. A bite in your dream could signify a betrayal or an impending spiritual ailment, often from sources closer than you think. Remember, Jesus himself warned in Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. It's a wake-up call to be spiritually vigilant, even in familiar territories. In both cases, these dreams are a call to action. It's a signal to armor up spiritually, to engage in fasting and prayer. These practices aren't just religious rituals. They are your spiritual warfare tools to break these unseen bonds and cleanse your spirit. When you rise in the morning after such dreams, let your first meal be that of spiritual fortitude, prayer, fasting, and the Word of God. Just as David faced Goliath not with physical strength but with faith in a sling, face these spiritual challenges with the weapons God has provided us. Remember, these dreams are not to scare us but to prepare us. They remind us that our lives are battlegrounds where unseen forces vie for influence. But take heart, for Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 doesn't end with a warning. It's a call the spiritual arms. We're reminded that our real fight isn't against what we can see, but against these spiritual forces. So let's stand firm, armored with faith and vigilant in prayer. For in Christ, we have victory over every hidden snare of the enemy. Number two, night after night, you find yourself walking through a shadowy realm where the faces of the departed, those whom you once held dear, appear to you. But here's the catch. These aren't the loving spirits of your ancestors. They are, instead, cunning disguises employed by familiar spirits. These deceptive entities are not here to comfort, but to ensnare, perpetrating generational curses that have clung to your family like a persistent shadow. These dreams, where the deceased seem to reach out from beyond, are not just mere figments of your imagination. They are spiritual battlefields. These familiar spirits, masquerading as your departed loved ones, are there to form covert covenants, leading you unknowingly down paths that mirror the struggles and failures of those gone before you. The Bible, or guiding light, clearly states that God is the God of the living, not the dead. The memories of our beloved may remain etched in our hearts, but the Lord warns us against seeking counsel or communication with the dead. So, when the night brings images of those who have passed, remember, it's a sly trick of the enemy, a wolf in sheep's clothing. But it's not just this appearance of the deceased that holds significance in your dreamscapes. 
Have you ever found yourself in a dream, besieged, beaten, and battered, perhaps by faces unknown or unseen? This isn't just a random nightmare. It's a glaring sign, a spiritual SOS. Your spirit, the very essence of your being, is under siege. Forces unseen, emissaries of darkness are launching covert attacks. It's a spiritual ambush, a warning of betrayal or hidden animosity, a revelation that not all is as it seems in the waking world. In these moments of revelation, what do we do? Do we surrender to fear, to despair? Absolutely not. This is where our faith, our belief in a power greater than any darkness comes into play. It's a call to arms, a reminder to don the full armor of God, to stand firm against these spiritual onslaughts. Prayer becomes our fortress, our stronghold in these turbulent times. When dreams hint at the looming shadow of the spirit of death or the betrayal of unseen forces, it's a clarion call to seek divine intervention. It's in these times of trial that we must fervently seek the face of God, asking for deliverance, for protection, for the breaking of chains that generations past have unwittingly forged. Remember, dear listener, in the realms of dreams, not everything is as it seems. Number three, have you ever found yourself in a dream where you're locked away, trapped in a prison or a cage? It might feel like you're screaming for help, but no sound escapes. This isn't just a nightmare, it's a signal. A red flag waving in the spiritual wind. It symbolizes that there are unseen chains binding you, holding you back from your true potential. Think about it. You have the skills, the heart, the drive, but something inexplicable keeps pulling you back. It's as if an invisible hand is pressing down, keeping you from soaring. These dreams, my friends, are wake-up calls. They're God's way of showing you that there are spiritual strongholds in your life, barriers that you need to break through with fervent prayer and faith. And then there are those other dreams, the ones that leave you waking up feeling dirty and confused talking about dreams of a sexual nature. Now, I know this is a delicate subject, but it's crucial we talk about it. These dreams aren't just figments of your imagination or random firings of a sleepy brain. No, these are spiritual encounters of a dark kind. The faces you see, the situations you find yourself in, they aren't just dreams, they're spiritual attacks. These encounters are the enemy's ploys, his way of planting seeds of lust and perversion, of binding you with chains of sin and shame. It might be hard to believe, but these dreams are no less than spiritual warfare. The demonic forces use these visions as a way to forge evil covenants, agreements that they hold against you. These covenants have real consequences in your waking life. They might manifest as struggles in your relationships, hindrance in your path to marriage, or even barriers in your financial prosperity. It's like walking through life with a heavy chain dragged behind you, unseen but ever-present. But here's the hope, the light in the darkness. These chains can be broken. You have a powerful ally in this spiritual warfare, God. When these dreams come, don't dismiss them as mere figments of your imagination. Recognize them for what they are, alarms calling you to spiritual action. Turn to prayer, seek God's face, ask for deliverance. He is waiting to set you free, to break those chains, and to lead you out of that spiritual prison. Remember, in this journey of life, you're not alone. God is with you. His angels are fighting for you, and His strength is made perfect in your weakness. So, let's stand together, pray together, and break these spiritual strongholds. Number four, friends. Have you ever found yourself in a dream, standing amidst a somber burial scene, or seeing everyday objects like your keys or wallet buried in a mysterious place? These are not just random images. They could be spiritual red flags, signaling something far more serious. Let's take a moment to understand this. Imagine you're at a burial, a place where we confront the reality of mortality. Now, picture in your dream, rats and roaches scurrying around, these aren't just pests. In the spiritual realm, they symbolize forces working against you, the spirit of destruction and household wickedness. It's like having an unseen enemy silently working to undo your life's work, targeting your prosperity, your career, and your well-being. But there's more. 
Ever dreamt of losing your hair or seeing it being cut off? In many cultures, hair represents strength and glory. Losing it in a dream might feel unsettling, but it's more than that. It's a spiritual alert, a warning that your personal glory, your God-given potential is under attack. Now you might ask, why is this happening to me? Remember, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, Jesus said, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. This is a powerful reminder that even while we are physically alive, we can be spiritually asleep or dead. These dreams are wake-up calls, urging us to shake off spiritual lethargy and take up our spiritual armor. You see, the enemy, the devil, doesn't play fair. He's cunning and relentless, but here's the truth. He's also defeated. Yes, these dreams might seem like a plot straight out of a horror movie. But remember, we are the protagonists of this story, armed with faith and the power of prayer. The Bible tells us God has not given us the spirit of fear. So, while these dreams might be alarming, they are not meant to scare us into submission, but to stir us into action. The key here is not to ignore these signs. If left unaddressed, these spiritual attacks can manifest in our waking lives, affecting our work, our relationships, and our peace. But there's hope, a shining light in this darkness, the power of prayer and the authority we have in Jesus Christ. So, what do we do when faced with such dreams? We stand firm, we pray, we declare victory over every plan of the enemy. Remember, our battles are not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. And in this battle, we are not helpless. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Dreams of burials, pests, or losing our hair might be unsettling, but they're not the end of the story. They are calls to spiritual arms. Let these dreams not be a source of fear, but a catalyst for faith. Let them remind us to stay vigilant, to pray without ceasing, and to hold fast to the promises of God. For in Him, we have victory, hope, and a peace that surpasses all understanding. Number five, have you ever found yourself in a dream, heart pounding, as you're running from an unseen terror or a ferocious beast? Or perhaps you've woken up with the unsettling image of blood, an alarm bell in the night. These aren't just figments of your imagination. They could be signals, spiritual alerts, if you will. Firstly, consider the profound biblical truth that life is inherently connected to blood. When you see blood in your dreams, particularly your own, it's more than a mere nightmare. It could be a divine signal, a warning bell, alerting you to an unseen battle waging against your spirit. Think about it. A pregnant woman dreaming of losing blood. This isn't just a random fear. It's a spiritual SOS call to arms for prayer and vigilance. But here's the twist. These dreams, as alarming as they are, aren't meant to paralyze us with fear. Oh no, they are in fact God's way of handing us the battle plans of the enemy. It's like being given a secret map to navigate and thwart the adversary's schemes. So, when you wake up from a dream, don't let fear rule you. Instead, let it drive you to your knees in fervent prayer. Now, Let's talk about those chase dreams. Ever found yourself sprinting in your dream, pursued by something terrifying? It's like you're in a thriller, but you're the lead actor, and the stakes are your soul. This isn't just a run-of-the-mill nightmare. It's a telltale sign of spiritual warfare, a clear indicator of witchcraft acting against you. These dreams are different. They're not random. They're targeted attacks, and they require a strategic spiritual response. But here's the key. It's not only about what happens in the dream. It's also about how you feel when you wake up. Do you carry that fear into your day, feeling a shadow lurking behind you? That's a significant sign, my friends. It's as if the dream is leaping out of your sleep and into your reality. That's when you know it's more than just a dream. It's a spiritual alert. So, what do you do when you're faced with these harrowing night visions? You turn to the ultimate source of power and protection, God Almighty. You see, these dreams, they're not just warnings, they're also invitations. Invitations to engage in deeper, more fervent prayer, to put on the full armor of God and stand firm against the wiles of the enemy. Let's not shy away from these spiritual battles. Instead, let's face them with the courage and strength that comes from faith. Remember, in Christ, we are not victims of the night. 
We are victors in the light. These dreams, as ominous as they may seem, are opportunities for us to engage in spiritual warfare, to draw closer to God, to experience His delivering power in our lives. So, my dear friends, let's embrace this journey with hope and conviction. Let's see these dreams not as sources of fear, but as calls to spiritual action. Together, let's pray, stand firm, and witness the mighty hand of God moving in our lives, turning our nightmares into testimonies of His grace and power. Remember, in Christ, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Stay blessed, stay vigilant, and keep the faith. And if you have liked it so far, please drop a like and subscribe.